first of all, I want to welcome 15 Harvard uh, students, graduate and undergraduate students. This is our fourth annual J-Term uh, study uh, winter session. So I wanted to welcome 15 of them. This is the largest group, the handsomest group, the sharpest, <laughs> um, and the most active group. So I want to welcome you all. I also want to welcome, I have two Harvard faculty here, and I wanted to welcome them here as well. We have Professor Melika Zagal, who is a professor of Islamic uh, life and thought at Harvard University. Uh, she uh, uh, is a professor in the Department of Near East Languages and Civilizations and in the Committee of Study of Religion. And she also is the supervisor for, for many um, uh, uh, doctoral students. Several of them are here in Tunisia today. So she, uh, she shuttles back and forth uh, between uh, Cambridge and Tunisia. Your miles must be getting very high. Your frequent flyer. So welcome, welcome here as well. And also we have Noor Badmada, who teaches Arabic uh, language and literature, and several of her students are here as well. So uh, in many ways, our family is uh, very well represented here today. I also want to welcome uh, Dr. Patricia Mutahida, who happens to be the roommate of our speaker tonight. Yeah. Uh, she is a, uh, a doc she has her doctorate in archaeology. So. Uh, we, uh, she was quite instrumental in uh, our trip yesterday, our first trip to Carthage, and I wanted to welcome you here as well. And, um, and to my Tunisian friends um, and colleagues, I want to say welcome as well. Uh, this is a very special occasion for me. I'm going to be a little long-winded, hoping that Professor Munira shows up pretty soon. Um, Roy Mutahida is um, a, the Gurney Professor Emeritus of, uh, Islam, of History. His specialty is classical Islamic history, but um, that's only one of his specialties. He has many specialties as well. Um, I also want to say in a personal note that it's a great privilege for me to, um, to uh, uh, our star guest is here. <laughs> Anyway, now we can start in full. Uh, Professor Mutahed is not only an a, 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 a internationally renowned uh, professor and scholar of Islamic history, he is also um, a long-serving professor at Harvard University. Um, he, before that, he did all of his degrees, by the way, his bachelor's, master's, and PhD at Harvard, and then he went off somewhere to some small college in the South <laughs> University, uh, and uh, like a good uh, 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 hot son of Harvard, he came back, and he's been with us many years. Um, Professor Mutahed is also a former director of the Center for Middle Eastern Studies, so in many ways, this is his office um, as well. Um, Professor Mutahed, on a personal note, is, um, I think, singly responsible for getting me to Harvard. Um, I don't know if he remembers that, but I <laughs> he has a special place, a special place in my heart, except in those days when Harvard drives me crazy. <laughs> Why did I listen to him? But anyway, it is a great pleasure for me, professionally, academically, intellectually, and uh, personally, to uh, uh, invite him and to have him here with us today. Um, Professor Mutahida is uh, an international scholar, as I said. Uh, he is, um, his doctoral dissertation, by the way, on the Buyid Empire was turned into an extremely successful book, A Loyalty and Leadership in Early Islamic Society, in which he talks very uh, in detail about uh, bonds that bring people together in the medieval period. It is a masterstroke of uh, medieval social history, and today it's still considered to be one of the most important uh, sources of medieval classical um, social and political history. Um, his Mantle of the Prophet, Religion and Politics in Iran, has been um, translated into how many languages? 30? Did I something? I don't no? know. I don't know. Oh, many, many, many languages. <laughs> um, it was given the distinction, it has been given the distinction to be one of the top five, the best books in the history on in Islamic history, in Middle Eastern history. So for those of you who have yet to read Mantle of the Prophet, I would recommend you get a copy tonight and start mm -hmm. reading it uh, before you leave. Um, this, many say, I don't know if I'm going to embarrass you, but many say that this book uh, is the result of Professor Mutahida receiving a MacArthur Genius Award. Um, it is truly an outstanding work of, of, of scholarship. 
He's also the author of the Crusades from perspective of Byzantine and the Muslim world. So in addition to be, his being a scholar of the, of the classical Islam, he is, uh, he won't say that he's an expert, but I think he is of Byzant Byzantine history as well, of crusade history uh, as well as that. Uh, he also is the author of Lessons in Islamic Jurisprudence, in which there is a translation and commentary of uh, medieval Islamic effect. And um, uh, he, I'm gonna mention two more things because there's just so many uh, things that he's done. Um, he's also the author of um, A Clash of Civilizations, an Islamist critique of the famous Clash of Civilizations that was written by, and I can't think Samuel of it. Huntington. Samuel Huntington. <laughs> um, and this is arguably the most important uh, critique against Samuel uh, Huntington's thesis. Um, I remember in our old building at CMES, uh, we were on the fifth floor, and Samuel Huntington was on the third floor. So often enough, um, we would all share the same elevator. And I always wondered if they were going to start having a discussion on the elevator. <laughs> um, I'm that. Um, I just want to say, in addition to him being a tremendous scholar of uh, Islamic studies and Islamic history, uh, of uh, world history, for that matter, as well, um, Roy is also the author of this uh, one of the most amazing articles on the Arabian Nights, the Ajaib and Al-Fulayda and Layla, which is still today, after the years that it was published, is still one of those very important um, uh, articles on the Arabian Nights. So in addition to him being an Arabic, he is also a Adib, and his knowledge of classical Arabic. And sometimes when you get him in the right mood, you can even argue with him about modern Arabic novels. <laughs> he is extensive, and it's wide, and uh, it's a pleasure to introduce him. So uh, I think I've spoken enough. And again, it's a great, great pleasure to introduce to you our uh, eminent professor, uh, Alama Sheikh Mam. <laughs> uh, welcome to our, your home in Tunisia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Over there. I first came to Tunisia in 1961. Is that too loud? I'm sorry. Am I, what am I doing? Okay. Uh, 1961, uh, when I was given a year after graduating from Harvard to travel and do nothing, which I did scrupulously, <laughs> but that included a very happy visit to, to Tunis. And I met one of the ancient uh, adibs of Tunisian literature, Hassan Husni Abdel Wahab, who was the uh, then head of the section Arabe in the museum. And he gave me several books. He, I was a nobody, and he was kind enough to talk with me and sign the books over to me, and I still have them. One is called Ashahirat <laughs> Tunisiat. I can't remember all the titles, but they were wonderful, and I still have them. Um, it's a great pleasure to be back here. I'm a little bit embarrassed to present a talk on a what is a hot current topic in, in, in Tunisian uh, dis, uh, political discussions, the sacred and the secular. But as I, if you read my title carefully, Reflections On. <laughs> so <laughs> this is a descriptive and not a prescriptive talk. Re reflections on the sacred and secular dimensions in classical Islamic thought. Um, at first, the search for any possible analog to sacred and secular in the Islamic realm may seem unpromising and even if we are to believe some authorities, totally wrong-headed. Bernard Lewis, until very recently the doyen of English-speaking specialists on the Islamic world, tells us in an introductory essay written in 1984, quote, slide one, mm. How do I, I uh, how do I progress the slides? Mm. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm very stupid. Uh, I should, should I? I okay, okay. Uh, for a traditional Muslim, church and state are one and the same. They are not separate or separable institutions, and there is no way of cutting through the tangled, tangled web of human activities and allocating certain things to religion 
others to politics, some to the state and some to a specifically religious authority. Such familiar pairs of words as lay and ecclesiastical, sacred and profane, spiritual and temporal, and the like, have no equivalents in classical Arabic and other languages. Uh, Bernard Lewis uh, was my colleague for many years, and he loved to give lists of synonyms. He was very, <laughs> very facile speaker. Uh, since the dichotomy which these words express is deeply rooted in Christendom, but was unknown in Islam until comparatively recent times when its introduction was the result of external influences, end quote. This argue, uh, lecture will argue that such descriptions of the pre-modern intellectual world of Muslims is misleading. In fact, the widespread view of Western Islamicists that there is a sphere in which, as Bernard Lewis claims, that sacred and profane, or even sacred and secular, are undifferentiated and undifferentiable for Muslims in all periods, corresponds much more to the assertions of some contemporary Islamic revivalists than to the great majority of pre-modern Islamic opinion in both the North Africa and the Middle East. I do want to emphasize that I am talking about the Islamic world before 1500 uh, of the Common Era. More specifically, I'm talking about the Islamic world between the fifth century of the Islamic era and the rise of the early em modern empires such as the Ottomans in the ninth century of the Islamic era. We all too often forget that the overwhelming majority of Muslims at present do not live in the Middle East or North Africa. And the last thing I want to offer you is a reified and unchanging Islam divorced from historical context. Uh, uh, before returning to possible analogs of sacred and secular, I think we should consider why contemporary Orientalists and Islamists have said that no such analogs did exist. First, in some sense, they correctly see Islam as the outcome of a long trend in the history of Western Asia. The ancient Babylonians carried off each other's gods. Um, the, uh, uh, that includes, of course, the Phoenicians who came, <laughs> came here to Tunis. Um, they, uh, the, the ancient Babylonians carried off each other's gods. The Assyrians pretended that they smashed alien gods. Apparently, they didn't smash them as much as they talked about smashing them. But, And the new monotheistic religions, like Christianity, claimed that their god was not limited to any local place or season or period. By extension, then, might not some form of monotheism hold that the moral will of their one god should be the standard for all human conduct in all places and at all times and in all matters. So it would seem some Muslims view their own religion, but it is not only Muslims, but non-Muslims, Christians, for example, who view their religion in this way as well, a point to which I hope to return. Second, many of these Islamists um, are caught up in a Eurocentric, Eurocentric consideration that uh, considerations that have remained all too common in my field of study. Only after explaining why the Islamic North, Middle East and North African societies are what they are can we ask why are they not what they are not. In, in other words, what not, why are they not what the West is. First, we have to explain them in and of themselves. Why didn't the Islamic world produce a the question? The result of this topsy-turvy uh, discussion are questions such as, why didn't the Islamic world produce an industrial revolution? Why didn't it produce <coughs> representative sy systems of government? And the, the like. Such questions are not irrelevant. 
Anyone who has spent years, as every Islamic studies scholar in the West is compelled to do, uh, explaining that the Quran is not the Bible, a Bible, Muhammad is not a Christ, and the ulama, the Muslim specialists in religious learning, are not priests, will understand the temptation to dwell on explaining why things are not what they are not, instead of explaining why they are what they are. Incidentally, the, posi the point of, but, but concerning the lack of priesthood in Islam and of any sacraments that might mark some person as priestly in function does largely account for the absence of any distinction between lay and ecclesiastical. But are we really faced with a vast, flat, and undifferentiated terrain as seen by some of these specialists? I think not. To begin with, etymologically, the, the word for holy, al-muqaddas, exists in other Semitic languages, in particular in the Bible. Words from this root are used several times in the Quran to express sacred space, which is muqaddas, sanctified, from all other worldly space. As when we are told in at least two different occasions, um, occasions. First, when God spoke to Moses, uh, slide three. إِذَا نَادَاهُمْ رَبُّهُ بِالْوَادِ الْمُقَدَّسِ طُوَى Excuse me, I studied Tajweed in, uh, the, uh, with the Sheikh of the Azhar, <laughs> and, uh, but I also said it was Sul Fiqh, but I know <laughs> I'm, my, 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 uh, I, I, my recitation of the Quran is very plain. Um, uh, so, uh, when your Lord called out to Moses on this, uh, uh, in the sacred valley of Tuwa, this is below Mount Sinai. <coughs> so you have a place uh, which is Muqaddas in a more intense way than any ordinary place. Also, next slide. Uh, we have... Uh, O oh my people, enter the Holy Land, which God has assigned to you, and do not turn your backs, and then become losers, and then understood fat. Ya qawmi, ya qawmi dhkuru al-ard al-muqaddasata al-allati katab Allahu lakum, wa la tartaddu ala adbarikum, fa tantakil tanqalibuna Tantalibu, excuse me, Tantalibu Khasirin. Okay, so uh, this is, O oh my people, enter the holy land which God has assigned to you and do not turn back, and the hence, and then the fa there, and hence become losers. Uh, of course, as you all, this audience will know, Jerusalem is called Al Quds, the holy place to this day. But the root associated most strongly, both in the Qur'an and throughout the Islamic tradition, with space, sacred space, haram or haram, haram, both in the Qur'an and throughout the tradition, uh, is a root similar uh, to that uh, uh, which is the basis for the term haram used for private quarters of a house. It is also familiar to Bible scholars, in particular because of the Hebrew cherem or herem, I don't know Hebrew, so I, I hope I'm not mispronouncing, which specialists tell me has the same semantic spectrum as the Arabic haram. It is well to remember that haram is a term for places, things, and actions that are separated from common use or contact either because they are prescribed as abominations to God or because they are considered uh, consecrated to God. If we think of the harem, usually translated as women's quarters, in its proper legal sense, that is, the apartments that are allowed only to uh, men within prohibited degrees of the marriage, we understand the relatedness of sanctification and prohibition in those things that have been separated from other things by God's injunction. 
Not only is the connection of haram with sacred space and time amply attested to in the Quran, but they are also amply attested to in the life of the Prophet, who, according to traditional accounts of his life, personally supervised the demarcation of the boundaries of al haramain the two haram areas, or haram areas of Arabia, one in Mecca and one in Medina. So there could be no ambiguity as to the exact areas within which certain ritual laws uh, for pilgrims were to be observed. To my mind, this brings us to the discussion among students of religion about the sacred and profane. The interesting feature of the Islamic case is that the sacred and prohibited are special categories at the far end, or if you would conceive of it as a circle, at the meeting point of the circle, uh, of the spectrum of things and actions, leaving ordinary things and actions to fill the space between them. They are both areas restricted by divine instruction. They belong to the category that students of religion call by the Latin word fascinanes, that is fascinating, being either very attractive or dreadful. The political life in the period in which I specialize, which is the Islamic Middle East from the fourth, in the fourth and fifth century of the Hijra, or 10th and 11th century common era, illustrates another distinction, distinct division between sacred and profane. Here, I think the word secular is more appropriate than profane. The political history of the Islamic community explains why such a distinction arose. After the death of the Prophet Muhammad, Muslims mostly unanimously accepted that there should be a single political leader for their community, the Khalif or Caliph, successor, and this institution of the Caliphate was indivisible. Just as the universal, all-powerful God had revealed through a single prophet a law meant for all mankind, he had intended that all those who accepted that law should participate in a single moral community whose structures of rights and obligations should be made uniformly by a single political authority. The, the, uh, the one in the Neoplatonic thought so popular in medieval Islamic thought, the world, sensibly chose to emanate itself to the many through a single intelligence, as surely in the political world as in the metaphysical world. But in the fourth century of the Hijra, or 10th century AD, uh, the political unity of the Islamic world was a fond memory. Dozens of independent governors, governments vied with each other, including, of course, an independent caliphate of the Fatimids here. And the Abbasid caliphs, reduced to ceremonial figures, were suffered to continue in part because of their grand, the grandiloquent titles which they granted to whichever mayors of the palace happened to control them. These titles are eloquently, are eloquent testimony that a sort of de facto recognition of the divisions between sacred and secular, or sacred and profane, had come into being. At first, the caliphs gave these mayors of the palace titles such as helper of the dynasty, Nasir al-Dawla. This, of course, was first given, I believe, the Hamdanid uh, ruler, uh, Nasr al-Dawla, Hamdanid ruler. That is, helper of the dynasty of caliphates. Adawla is the uh, Adawla al Abbasiyah, understood here. Nasr al-Dawla al, al uh, 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 The dynasty in, uh, that, uh, the dynasties that use this Adawla title uh, in the time of the later Abbasids were like the Japanese emperors, um, uh, possessed of a revered lineage, even though they had lost power to their Middle Eastern equivalents of shoguns. Soon, however, the mayors of the palace wanted longer and loftier titles. And by the second half of the fourth or 10th century, these titles, there are titles such as glory of the Daula and helper of religion, Baha al-Dawla wa Nasr al-Din. In these titles, of course, Dawla is slowly moving away from its reference 
to a specific dynasty, that is the Abbasids, and to its later medieval meaning of power, turn in power. Incidentally, my grandmother was named Dolat, which is a Persian, ver <laughs> Persian version of the word Daula. Anyway, um, another step in the evolution of titulature and associated political ideas appears with the Seljuks, the powerful Turkish dynasty that entered the Middle East from Central Asia in the mid 5th or 11th century and united, reunited most of Western Asia under one government. Slide five. Yeah. The first major uh, ruler of this dynasty, uh, Toghrul Beg, uh, somebody's name Toghrul in the room, I believe. <laughs> the first major, major uh, ruler of this dyni, to dynasty, Toghrul Beg, uh, 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 controlled the powerless caliph in Baghdad and gave himself, through the caliph, the title Rukna Dunya Wadin. That's my beautiful typing up there. That's a support of the world and religion. To my understanding, in the mentioning together of world and religion, we have a reference to something familiar to sacred and secular. Um, the, uh, uh, the great jurist of the era, I haven't put this in the lecture, but Imam al-Haramain Juwaini uh, 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 actually explains that this, this means uh, there are dunyawi things which are under the control of a sort of a civil official. Uh, dunya, and, and the adjective of, of course, dunyawi, uh, the world is ref referred to several times in the Qur'an, specifically in contrast to the next life, uh, for it means the nearer thing, adna dunya, of course, that is, the nearer life, as contrasted to the final life, al-akhira, or akhira, slide six. Ah, oh, okay. Um, Okay, let me <laughs> get to six. Ulaika ladina aladina shtaru shtaru shtarau al hayat dunya bil akhirati fala yukhaffafu anhum anhumul adabu wallahum yunsarun. These are the people who bought the life of this world at the price of the next world. That is losing the life of the next world. Their penalty shall not be lightened, nor shall they be helped. Okay, so here's a um, contemptus mundi, or despising the world, is a strong theme in in uh, many writings by Muslim thinkers, which follows the spirit of the Quran, the Quranic verse which I just read to you. Uh, but the world held at its proper subordinate evaluation, a dunya, is meant to be used and lived in. Uh, next slide. Sorry, my, my limitations as a typewriter <laughs> squeezed this into a smaller space. Um, uh, uh, we are your friends. It, no, it is God who apportions their means of livelihood in this world and those and raises some in position over others. Uh, um, uh, well, uh, just part of the verse. Okay, so uh, that's not the full verse. Uh, uh, my teacher at the Azhar would be ashamed of me. But sorry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the, uh, so here we have this slide. Another verse, uh, well, another verse, next slide, I guess, says, We, perhaps meaning the angels, are your friends in this world and in the next. 
and you will have therein whatever your souls desire, and you shall have therein whatever you request. Uh, uh, the uh, critical word, nahnu awliya'ukum fil hayati dunya wa fil akhirah. So it, again, this, this idea of the two, uh, two worlds, clearly in the Quran, and then clearly used by people like Total Beg to talk about Rokna Deen wa Dunya. Though the Muslim world, as I said, has produced ascetics, but uh, we shouldn't think that everybody was ascetic all the time. A great deal of homilytic literature offers the world, that's the dunya, as a place in which pious people can and probably must come to terms with. Uh, in the new political conditions of the 4th century of the Hijra, or 10th century common era, and following centuries, those terms uh, meant accepting a sphere that was probably not run in an altogether righteous manner, but uh, was surely beyond the control of any individual Muslim. This sphere was the dunya. There was another sphere in which a Muslim could work to develop his relations to God and hence his, uh, his position in the next life. This sphere was deen. And while I think deen is rightly translated religiosity, because it means the exercise of religion, I here use the simpler term religion. Rulers took titles implying that their presence helped people both in the dunya and, dunya and the deen. And I think the existence of two spheres, for all that they overlapped and interpenetrated each other, and they did, was generally understood. Interest, interestingly, the tradition of the scholastic sciences cultivated among Muslims gives considerable support to this view of two spheres, although the divisions suggested by the scholastic sciences do not exactly correspond with Deen wa Dunya. One uh, such division exists amongst the followers of Al-Ash'ari, the great theologian who died in 324 of the Hijra, or 936 AD. Their argument about the nature of the Creator says that the world was on, only a possible existence and there is nothing about it uh, in and of itself which requires that it exists. Since it does exist, the world, a dunya, we must conclude that something other than it has chosen it for existence or non-existence and this something is the numinous or spiritual world, the world of deen. The jurists and jurist consults had to squarely face the problems of the two realms or two spheres. It was the jurists who had to tell people when and why the law saw actions to be purely matters of dunya, of this worldly con con conduct, or matters vital to deen, religion, and hence matters affecting their position in the next world, or a mixture of the two. There are many matters considered to be a mixture of the two. One central tenet that Muslim jurists could bring to bear on this problem is contained in the guidelines in Islamic uh, jurisprudence, namely, al-asl fil, fil ashia al-ibaha. This is a, the central principle in affairs is lawfulness. Al-asl, this uh, as a semi-Maliki country, <laughs> this is a very important uh, precept of law, uh, rule of law in, in Maliki jurisprudence. Um, that is, when something is neither commanded, disrecommended, uh, or forbidden, or disliked, it is lawful, and therefore open to the free exercise of human wishes. There is a large realm in which uh, the pious believer is free to choose his or her action. This realm belongs to the semi-secular, and this audience will, as this audience will know, another tenet is the distinction between Fard al-Kifaya and Fard al-Ain. The former category, Fard al-Kifaya, is the duty incumbent on the community, but not incumbent on each of its members, i.e., such as a communal duty such as the jihad. 
For other category, fardal ayn is the duty incumbent on the individual, such as daily prayer. To my thinking, and I would argue also to the thinking of some pre-modern uh, Muslims in North Africa and the Middle East, these tenants created space for important distinctions in the world. The lawfulness of all things not commanded or forbidden uh, created another access uh, around which to construct a sacred and profane distinction created by the haram and non-haram distinction discussed above. Uh, and the distinction between individual and communal obligations made it possible uh, uh, for there to be a de facto, if not de jure, distinction between um, uh, many things that are religious and one would say sacred duties and are not essential to the individual's salvation and others that are not essential to an individual's salvation. Um, yet another relevant consider consideration for the jurists is the distinction between God's claims and human's claims. Uh, in the discussion of this distinction, and previous themes of the paper are evoked and related to each other. It is important to remember that the word here used is haq, claim, uh, plural hukuk, which in, of course in modern Arabic means rights, uh, but in medieval Arabic it meant claims. Uh, 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 it, of course, claims and rights are very close to each other. It's nothing, not making a great distinction. Uh, um, Okay, pre-modern Islamic law is indeed interested in rights, or more properly claims, but it is far more concerned with the classification of actions. Like al-ahkam al khamsa as you all know, is classification of uh, actions. Since once an action is classified, the claims of those concerned flow from the classification. Rulings as to the classification of actions are therefore much more central to law. Uh, claims are held to be at least of two kinds, divine, law, and human, nas. This latter term sometimes becomes haq al-abd or haq adami, prayer, fasting, and the fixed punishments, hudud, for crimes are example of God's claims against mankind and as such cannot be dropped. Their performance is a Muslim's duty. In contrast, debt and theft are examples of human claims in which the prosecution of the claim can take place only on the demand of the person or persons concerned. There's a wonderful story. <laughs> I shouldn't be interrupting to tell you, but a, a, a wonderful uh, story in Tanuchi <laughs> about a, a man who captures a debtor and uh, chains himself to the debtor and on their way home to Basra, wherever it is, they're sleeping in the desert and a lion comes and eats the creditor <laughs> and, and the debtor. Debtor is freed from the debt. Uh, it's not, I don't know how often that happens. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, sorry, that's irrelevant. Uh, in contrast, debt and theft are examples of human claims in which prosecution of the claim can take place only on the demand of the person or persons concerned. Many human claims can be transferred by the human concern or even transferred involuntarily as when a creditor's claim is inherited. This distinction is very important, not only for the questions of what things can be prosecuted, but also for judicial procedure. An open and still current question in Islamic law is whether a judge can or cannot act on his knowledge in cases before him or must he act only according to the evidence presented in the court? I mean, if the judge knows, knows, uh, knows evidence that has not been expressed before him. Uh, 
The majority opinion among Hanafi, I don't know the Maliki school on this law, this principle, but the majority school among the Hanafi laws, Hanafis, is that a judge can indeed act according to his knowledge in cases involving God's claims, but not in cases involving human claims. Uh, Human claims are in, uh, he must operate on, in human, in area of human claims, he must act according to the evidence presented in the court. The rationale behind this distinction, I think, is clear. Whereas the judge, Qadi, uh, and only the judge can take on the responsibility for surmising what might be God's claims, um, uh, uh, God's ruling, I should say, God's ruling concerning the fulfillment of God's claims, human claims are subject to human consideration and even human whims. Hence, according to some jurists, the judge must defer to the evidence humans choose to present to him. Human claims are, in fact, the realm of what Islamic thought, as well as Western thought, in deference to their common Aristotelian heritage, called the realm of practical reason, al-aql al-amali, as contrasted to speculative or theoretical reason. Of course, as those of you who know Islamic law, there are many, many cases where the two are mixed. That is, uh, both, uh, 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 both the kinds of claims, God's claims and human claims. A very brilliant and original 8th century or 14th common era century uh, Andalusi Juris Consul, Ashatavi, uh, terrific man, Al Muwafaqa, brings together many of these themes in his survey of the principle of Islamic law. Shatavi maintains that God, he is a Maliki, by the way, uh, Shatavi claims that God's claims, by their character, are not rationalizable. Ma'qul is the word he used. They are devotional acts. Ibadat. We should, of course, remember that devotional acts in this context included the prosecution and eventual punishment of people for certain kinds of crimes. As for human claims, their rationality is to me be measured, according to Shatabi, in terms of maslaha, a common term in Islamic law meaning the common weal, but specifically defined by Shatabi to mean, quote, what concerns the subsistence of human life, the wholeness of the human way of life, and the acquiring of what man's emotional and intellectual faculties require of him or her, in an absolute sense. At first, end quote, at first, at least for this jurisconsult, the existence of human claims has created a vast area for the exercise of human judgment, and therefore, a quasi-secular sphere. Let me try and sum up. Of course, there are no divisions in Islamic thought that neatly fit American divisions of sacred and secular. I'm using American <laughs> because that's some of my native land. Um, sacred and profane, spiritual and temporal, e ecclesiastical and lay, or even divine and human. But many of these dis distinctions have analogs in Islamic, the Islamic tradition. What precisely are the distinctions that we find in the medieval Islamic tradition? First, there is sacred space and more sacred space, sacred acts and sacred time. Incidentally, Alayam al Mutabarika is what the Quran calls uh, sacred time, the blessed time, uh, but I haven't time, sacred or secular time now <laughs> to go into the question of. Uh, this other word. Of course, in a religion in which religious purity, tahara, is related to proper acts in sacred space, unclean space is described in terms of impurity, which can be a najasa, and similar words. Terms for sacrilege, blasphemy, profanity, and desecration expect a mixture of reference to rupture of the sacred and to defilement. Interestingly, the two ends of the spectrum of things, the truly sacrosanct and the truly taboo or sacri sacrilegious, are described by the same term, haram uh, or haram, 
and present, I think, neighboring areas in a great circle. If you think of actions in a <laughs> circle, great circle, um, uh, a great circle um, that gives rulings or classifications for everything available to humans. While purposefully avoiding in this paper the names of Durkheim, Rudolf Otto, and Eliade, Mercia and Eliade, the great Western theorists of the sacred, I do think, as I have said above, that we have in the idea of haram a strong element of what Otto calls Foskinanes, something of powerful and sometimes frightening attraction, even if we are commanded to avoid it or to approach it only in a special manner. The non-sacralized space, time, and actions of the world are licit to us to use as we wish, but with a divinely set goal before us. Shatabi defines this goal as maslaha, common wheel, but others define it differently. Our uh, method of operating within this worldly sphere is practical reason. Al aqlul amali, man as the lord of creation, of, uh, creation is in effect given a series of moral puzzles to solve by virtue of his or her right to establish and drop claims in the world. The existence of a separate world of acts of devotion and of individual obligation to God allowed for this separate sphere of practical reason to become, in some cases, an analog, I'm not saying a perfect parallel, an analog to our secular space, I say our as an American, since it was a recognized, also with regret but with considerable realism, that it was necessary to compromise with the realities of government and communal life, and such compromise did not necessarily affect the individual believer's salvation. Does this mean that sacred and secular are universal categories? Not necessarily. The problem of the apparent dualism of God and the world is common to all monotheistic traditions. One partial solution is the words of a, in, a very, in the words of a very celebrated theologian is, quote, the recognition that springs from faith in the independence and comprehensibility of a secular world. In other words, God has chosen to give us a space. Um, it's not anti-religious at all. Such attitudes have existed uh, among Muslim, Muslims, particularly in the class, later classical period, which I have described, but they are based partly on faith. That is, the faith that God has indeed granted a secular sphere. In the Muslim case, the secular sphere is often seen as shot through with reference, references to the divine. In fact, significant areas of the worldly sphere are under exclusive or partial obligation to God alone. The secular or profane is only part of this worldly life, albeit, I think, an extremely large part. The different boundaries of these partly analogous distinctions strengthens my conviction that we have spoken all too freely and carelessly of the disenchantment of the world, the evocative term used by Max Weber. By disenchantment, he meant the rationalization of understanding according to modern thinking. Nevertheless, the sacred somehow survives. I believe that we cannot create a desacralized, disenchanted, and totally sanitized world. I do not write to advocate uh, I do not speak, I should say, <laughs> I do not speak to advocate a religious approach to this question. But I do hold that the life of this world will always have sacralized and profane areas, however variously designated. Um, any of you have visited, visited the copy of the U.S. Constitution, which, <laughs> which is put in some kind of uh, miracle gas so that it doesn't uh, and it rises from a stand and then sinks at night time, <laughs> that we have sacralized things. Um, I, I, uh, uh, in those in monotheistic traditions in which the world is a created thing and not wholly or even partially identical to its creator, the complete sacralization of the world seems to me difficult to imagine. Correspondingly, 
the full desacralization and disenchantment of the world has not yet arrived, even in my largely secular American tradition. And I personally believe it never will. Thank you. I'm most welcome question. Thank you very much. We we'll take questions from the room. First, I think. Thank you very much. This was terrific. <clears throat> There's just one analog, if I make you go back and please, forth please, between please. Islam and Christianity. Yeah. This idea of render to Caesar what is Caesar's right. and render to God what is God. Right. And right. some of what you were talking about in the dichotomy of that yeah. resonates with that idea of mm. rendering to. And, That's correct. Um, well, it's particularly after we no longer have sacralized caliphs. Uh, can people hear me? Yeah. Okay, okay. Particularly after the uh, after the disappearance or um, how to say uh, demotion of sacralized sorry sorry after the demotion of sacralized people like the caliph uh, of course taxes are collected but they're collected for a sultan <laughs> and, they, they, uh, and they may sometimes the sultans are say they will only collect islamically correct taxes but that doesn't mean they hand them over uh, hand them over to back to the people. <laughs> they do patronize. They do patronize uh, certain religious people who recognize uh, recognize them from Al Ghazali, as I said in Mamul Haramain Joani, Al Ghazali, and so on and so forth. They recognize that this is this uh, the, the rulers. There are rulers, de facto rulers, who are not sacred people. Yeah, and and they collect money. <laughs> yes. yeah. Thank you for uh, giving us the talk today. It's very informative. I was wondering, since we're in Tunisia and there are a lot of debates about religion and the sacred and the secular, what your opinion was, if you can share it with us about the debates that are going on in today's Tunisia. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not up to date. Uh, I, uh, I mean, I think various Muslim communities have come to uh, different conclusions about sacred and secular. Um, in America, we have a disestablishment of religion, which seems to result in more re religious observance than among Europeans, or Western Europeans, I should say. So that, that is a curious fact. I mean, the English have a, 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 an established church, Church of England, and uh, the um, but uh, I, and yet England is not a very religious country. <laughs> I don't know. It's a, and Muslims, Muslims, I think, uh, except the, those Muslims who believe that me, we must fight everything and create a universal caliphate, um, Muslims have come to different conclusions in different settings. I don't know if that's good or bad. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's not an adequate answer. I don't know about the Tunisian debates. Sorry. Okay, it's working. Um, actually, I have two questions. One is, uh, mm, I, I would say methodological. Um, so the first one is um, talking about, you mentioned Bernard Lewis starting uh, in your presentation. And uh, as a, I did my PhD in contemporary Middle Eastern politics. So, um, and I come from an Italian university that was very much against Bernard Lewis. And then I did my PhD in a London university in which Bernard Lewis was used as a, the main reference. Mm -hmm. now, now, my question is, uh, how can you explain the fact that Bernard Lewis and all this, uh, let's say, old school Orientalists are so overwhelming, their presence is so over overwhelming when talking about the politics of the Middle East still nowadays, 
And then the second question is related um, to, um, uh, actually, I would, uh, I would like to ask you whether is it possible to draw an analogy between what you said about uh, like how old Orientalists use this idea that there is no distinction between sacred and secular in, um, in classic, in, in Islamic thought in general, and uh, the same uh, approach that some of them have uh, regarding the existence of Dar al-Islam and Dar al-Harb in the um, classic Islamic thought, saying in, in many cases, these scholars, they say that because there is this distinction at the very, uh, in the beginning of the Islamic like uh, era, let's say, it Islamic peoples, they would always see the relationship with the West or with the others in conflictual terms. Instead, if we look at the way in which historically this concept has developed, we can see that there are other approaches possible, like I'm not mentioning now some of the books written on this topic. I would like to know from you whether you think it's the same type of approach of, or there is something, uh, I would say, more valuable about perceiving this idea of uh, the distinction, mm, how can I say, like, um, like m not veritable, like, mm, in, in a certain sense, like, this idea of this distinction being more useful to understand, like the conflict nowadays. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Those are very rich questions. I'm not sure I'll answer all of them. Uh, Orientalism and Middle Eastern politics are, yes, indeed, intimately uh, intertwined. Um, the, uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, the Arab-Israeli conflict or the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, I should say. Palestinian-Israeli conflict has invaded scholarship and made a lot of pushed ideas around <laughs> and people around, most unfortunately. Um, I, and while Bernard and I had different views on these things, we were perfectly civil colleagues together for 10 years at Princeton University. Um, uh, Bernard was very well spoken and so he used lots of adjectives as you saw he, st he started out with uh, just uh, a distinction between uh, church and state and then went on to use a lot of ac adjectives and so on. So Bernard during a friend and I used to count up how many synonyms Bernard would use <laughs> in his sentences in faculty meetings because he loved synonyms and sometimes it's beyond the, the meaning that he passed beyond the meaning that perhaps he had, might have had some validity if he just said two pairs of words instead of said his 20. Um, the, uh, I disapprove of the people who write off Bernard entirely because uh, he was a learned man on the other hand, there's no question he had strong uh, beliefs. Uh, as some of you may know, I am on my father's side of Iranian origin. And when, uh, uh, well, Bernard, although he claimed to not have been anything to do with the American war in Iraq, he actually had plenty to do with it because I know the people in the State Department he was talking to. And uh, he, uh, afterwards he said, it's nothing to do with me. I never recommend it. It's not true. But never mind. Uh, I think he uh, did a disservice. And then later, when the Israelis decided the Iranians were the greatest th threat, Bernard fed the idea that the Iranians were the greatest threat. Uh, I uh, also feel that this was support of an Israeli position, but I may be wrong. I don't know. I was not intimate with Bernard in his later years. Um, I was intimate when we were colleagues together at Princeton. Uh, Orientalism, uh, Orientalism has been too much, uh, um, too much the result of political considerations. I mean, obviously, uh, colonialism meant that you had to tell the natives, go practice your religion and we'll leave you alone as long as you have no political ideas. <laughs> I hope I don't offend anybody by saying that, but it's true. It's true. 
Uh, and um, so, um, now as for, uh, uh, there's much more to say on this. This is a vast, vast, very interesting topic. I'm glad you brought it up. As for Darul Islam and Darul Harb, I've actually written on this a little bit. Um, the, uh, of course, uh, and incidentally, Bernard and I disagreed about something. He and I, uh, when they, uh, they signed the, uh, when Sadat signed the peace with Israel, uh, Bernard said, you know, no Muslim can allow a treaty to be uh, in existence more than 10 years. Uh, that, that's true for some medieval uh, Muslims writing about trees. They say they can only last 10 years. But here we, uh, and as he said, this is all deception on their part. And so, so here we are many more than 10 years later. <laughs> I don't know, 30 years later, 25. And uh, the peace is still in existence as a, uh, maybe not a warm peace, but it's a peace between uh, the Israelis and the Egyptians. Uh, so they're fighting together in the Sinai, in fact. So I guess they, they have some shared interests. Um, the, uh, so uh, uh, there is also, uh, as m many Muslim modernists have talked about Dar es Salaam, we all we all, all live in the tre era of the treaty, uh, Darul Ahad, and so uh, in a sense, all people who are signatories of the United Nations uh, Charter are people who are a share an Ahad, the treaty. And uh, uh, well, it, it, it's a, it's a long and complicated stuff. So, but sure, there are people. Uh, people, particularly people in Afghanistan who believe in uh, Darul Harb and uh, <laughs> I don't know and there are people everywhere who believe uh, I mean some people everywhere it's uh, obviously not a settled issue among uh, Muslims but I don't believe majority Muslim opinion but here I'm guessing I'm guessing I, uh, I don't believe majority Muslim opinion is still occupied with fighting uh, Darul Harb um, I can name specific jurors who have given it up. Uh, um, uh, anyway, but never mind. That's a modern jurors. Anyway, yes, please. Well, I'm Saeed. Um, I've mainly like meddled with uh, in history. I've, me I've meddled with mostly USSR history. So my first question is going to mainly revolve around that in relation to your idea of sacralization. So you, you talk about Durkheim's concept of like a disenchanted society, one where like m reason, like uh, it rules over all else. So my question is like, even with rationality, don't don't you feel like as human beings we have this need to believe in something? So so so, so when I no, I think I think uh, I mean the as Durkheim said, the sense that the group is bigger than any individual. Is, is a sacralization of something that's uh, just natural. I mean, it's, uh, maybe it's hard, hard, it's in our hard drives. <laughs> you, lo you look at like artifacts from like 80,000 years ago, there's always been this need to believe. You no, know? no, that's why, I mean, I, you know, that's why we, as I said, Americans, yeah. for them the Constitution is Democracy. the sacralized. Democracy. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. No. Yeah. The, like, yeah. Yeah. For Russia, like you go and you no, see absolutely. Lenin's mausoleum, like during the USSR, USSR's age, right. or like you know those dictatorships under right, those right, 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 right. No, God sacralized, yeah. sacralized Lenin. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, <laughs> sacralized Lenin. Exactly. No. And my second question would relate to this quote of Bernard Lewis, mm. and I would somewhat agree with him with this specific quote in the sense that it relates to the core foundations of Islam like how it was built, as much it, as it was about a religion of faith, it mm -hmm. was also a religion of, of growth of an empire. Mm -hmm. Because it, 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 yeah. did, it did dominate the region, it right. went on to dominate yeah. the f furthest extents of, yeah. of Iberia all the way to Iran. And I would think like to a certain extent a way to preside over people would be to have a, a strong institutional system sure. in faith and at the yeah. same, same time a strong institution in law and uh, yeah. and specific th that aren't inseparable, you, th that can't separate. And would you would would you think like the core tenets of Islam in that sense have been corrupted in today's world with nationalism presi presiding over all else? 
I'm, I'm, I'm not going to give mm. personal theology <laughs> at all, <laughs> but I, I, I think we should uh, recognize that. Um, and this isn't to say like it's completely right or completely wrong. This is. Just I, I, yeah, yeah. I don't. I know. I. I, I don't know. For Tunisians, they must decide. <laughs> As Tunisians, I'm, not, I, I'm. I'm a Yankee, and. Uh, <laughs> and uh, born in Manhattan, so. <laughs> But this, these are good points, very important and interesting points. I can't, uh, I can't give a personal, uh, except that I too accept the uh, Constitution as a sacred document, except I, I agree that it hasn't been amended to keep people like Trump out of office. <laughs> but the, uh, Thank you, Professor, for, for the lecture. Um, my question perhaps would be a bit more theoretical. First of all, I'm Iheb Gurmezi. I'm a PhD candidate at, at MIT. Hi, Bill. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi, Louder. people. <laughs> Famous here, apparently. Uh, yeah, you can, OK. Can everyone hear me? The gray one. The gray one. All right, the gray one. Iheb comes from a secular university up the river from Harvard. Absolutely. <laughs> A very good one, a very good university. All right, my question will therefore be quite theoretical. Uh, and um, it's probably a bit related to what you call Islamic, classical Islamic thought as much as I think related to modern political Islamic thought. And uh, it's, uh, uh, the text you mentioned are from the Quran, obviously, but also you mentioned Imam Shatibi, uh, Abu Hanifa Naman, Malik ibn Anas. And we remain within the religious corpus here. And my question would be perhaps, to which extent the differentiation between sacred and secular could be sustainable when the boundaries of the secular are defined by the religious? Yeah, it's a good question. And uh, 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 there's obviously a difference, uh, as I said, uh, the, uh, the question is, should the community have a a constitution which uh, gives uh, rules for, um, I won't call it compromise, but rules for um, uh, decision making uh, and uh, rules for rights which uh, are uh, separated from religion. Uh, and uh, of course, as a US citizen, I'm used to that. And it seems to me it doesn't discourage religion, but it does discourage uh, religiously ruled communities. This is not only a question for Muslims, it's a question for, say, Orthodox Jews in the United States where they have their own internal courts and all kinds of things. Uh, it's, um, and uh, uh, other, other groups, it's not only, any, but um, it, 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 uh, do I believe uh, I believe it's certainly possible to have something like the American system, but it's true. It does not completely meet the idea that the, um, the uh, central system itself is generated by religion. And uh, is it possible to have the central system generated by religion and yet uh, a neutral agent? Um, that is a difficult question. It's hard to think that it is possible, but maybe. I'm sorry, what is your opinion? I don't have any, I was curious about yours. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I have to hesitate a little. I'm not sure. Uh, Bill, you're an American. I, I want to <laughs> abruptly change the subject. I want okay. to go back to this question of, of the binary Right. Of, of sacred and secular. Yeah, that's interesting. And I'm also interested in the question of what exactly is Islamic thought. And I'm thinking that early on in Islam, and if we yeah. can call, if I'm thinking Islam temporally, yeah. in, in, in the world of Islam, yeah, sure. there was a consciousness of the of difference between things that were dunyawi and things that no. were dini. And I'm no. thinking of the of literary, creative writing. Right, right. Look how pre-Islamic 
poetry not mm -hmm. only survived yeah. Islam but lasted. Yeah. And Muslims were very comfortable with that. They understood that uh, yeah. in a literary text or in adab literature yeah. or in kind of maqamat or whatever yeah. kinds of things, there were aspects of what we would call secular that interacted, right. uh, ran up against and, and uh, with, with, with the religious. Yeah, sure. So that I, I think if I can use the word Muslims generally speaking, or Muslim culture, Muslim right. intellectual thinking, was very comfortable at some point with negotiating between right. what was secular and what was um, right. uh, religious. So when Bernard Lewis talks about the idea that this, there's no such thing as, when he's talking about Islamic languages, I'm thinking about genres as well and sites. Yeah. And so culturally yeah. speaking, again, poetry and even prose yeah. uh, very, very much um, brought the two in t together. Sure, and, uh, sure. I, I just, your thoughts no, on absolutely. That? I mean, uh, as some of you may have guessed, uh, my ancestry is Iranian, and we have, of course, a national epic written around 1010 of the Common Era, uh, around 400 of the Hijra, uh, the Shahnameh. And uh, it's, uh, yes, at the end, they say a few words about, uh, uh, a few words about the Arab conquest, but up to that point, it's all, all completely, <laughs> completely about kingship and, and uh, hero heroism and uh, all sorts of things. Uh, and it, how can you call it a sacred text? It's not a sacred text. I mean, it's sacred for nationalists, but that's different. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. No, there, there's, there's lots of literature which is deeply revered. Uh, uh, and the, you know, from Bangladesh to, to Anatolia, people recite the Shahnameh. This is a long sort of Persianate world, but it has nothing to do with religion. <laughs> yeah. And I, of course, that's true of Arabic literature too. Of many things in Arabic literature, yeah. Veuillez parler en français si vous préférez. Arabia, Farsi. Man, Arabia. Hata afamu. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a, it was a very illuminating uh, talk. I li liked it a lot. I just wanted to ask you a, a little bit about the, about the term secular here, because yes. the, the, the English usage of the term secular is strictly institutional. Right. It's That's difference right. between church and, and state, even the That's Bernard Witt quote. It's, it's institutional, whereas you're talking more in terms of the history of ideas and, and concepts. Yeah. And I mean, the South Asian use of the term secular, where I come right. from, is, is very different. It means equal treatment of all religions. That's mm -hmm. a, it, it is, it's right. really not institutional. I so I mean, in, in, in terms of uh, classical Islamic thought, do you, do you see different ways of understanding the secular? Uh, oh, sure. Uh, but as I said, the, there's a whole literature uh, on uh, uh, we have a whole literature meant for sultans. Uh, some of them are mirrors from princes, and uh, so on and so forth. But uh, sultanic literature uh, about how to be a just sultan, of course, that's a, <laughs> a great ideal, but and perhaps an Islamic ideal. But uh, how to be a just sultan? There's a, there's a lot of uh, literature. It's a little bit inspired sometimes by uh, classical Greek examples and so on and so forth. It also has Islamic, uh, there are more Islamic versions of it. Um, uh, uh, secular, uh, of course, this is, uh, we have the investiture controversy in the European Middle Ages, which is an important, uh, believe it or not, I did European medieval history as one of my fields for my doctor, uh, investiture controversy is one of the important points at which it becomes clear that that the uh, sacred institutions are not going to control the secular institutions. Um, now, do you have uh, institutions um, established inside of Islamic law for secular things? That's an interesting question. I have to think about it. Yeah. But it was certainly in, in, in actions, there's certainly, there's certainly a scope of action that's clearly, re 
clearly secular, yeah. Hello, Professor. Hello. Oh, sorry. Excuse me for crossing my legs. I know it's wrong to do it in the Iranian world, probably wrong in the Arab world, but I have one leg shorter than the other. <laughs> I well, uh, thank you so much for being here today. It's a pleasure to, uh, to have you, you here in Tunisia. Um, I wanted to follow up on actually the last two points or questions um, right. that were raised, um, just about the, the difference between the sec sacred and the secular. Right. I'm always struck by the, the ease, or what appears to be ease, with which uh, uh, classical Muslim thinkers um, sort of moved between these two categories. Um, yeah. They didn't seem to have any difficulty with there being more or less sacred or yeah. and secular categories. Yeah. And yeah. I'm wondering if you could enlighten us on your thoughts on, on what might be some of the reasons why today in the modern world there's yeah. not this comfort. There's a because lot more sort of tension and, and questioning. And, yeah. and it seems to me, if I may just, yeah, um, one, one thing that appears to me is, is perhaps sort of a modern um, um, insistence or gravitation towards mm -hmm. um, you know fixed legal or political mores yeah. or institutions or sort of categories delineations yeah. basically and definitions um, and I was wondering what you what you thought about about all this yeah. thank you okay thank you um, I uh, I think I think some contemporary thinkers are uh, have a simplistic view of the past. There's no question, and uh, they uh, they have a simplistic view of how you uh, reform the present. I mean, they're clearly there are all sorts of issues for society, whether it's from garbage collection or on up, which are purely purely kind of secular concerns, and. Uh, um, uh, but um, uh, I, I don't mean that people should not be animated by uh, re religious ideas of virtue. Uh, and I think these people understood that what they were really advocating was Islamic ideas of virtue more than, uh, more than uh, uh, institutions of rule. Um, but I think there's a line of thinkers from Imam al-Haram and Juwaini up to, I don't know, up to the 15th century, uh, that uh, that are very realistic about it and realize that there are things that are not under their control. Uh, and uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't don't know much about the modern world. <laughs> Let me give up <laughs> trying to answer your question. I don't know enough. Thank you. Please. Thank you for the lecture, Sarah. Uh, I have a remark about uh, the, the word classical. Yes. I would appreciate it more if it was uh, Islamic thought only. Islamic thought? Only Islamic thought. Thought, OK. Because, uh, uh, I, 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 it's an arbitrary word. I tried to define it from. Because uh, Islamic thoughts, uh, sometimes in past, they was challenging. That's true. I, uh, I have an example uh, just, uh, just for uh, as a remark. Uh, a writer, a philosopher uh, named uh, Abu al al uh -huh. yes. was, was describing someone walking in, uh, in, the, in the paradise yes. and speaking to, uh, to, uh, to a poet there. It was a challenging idea that then, and uh, in that time, uh, the, uh, that was the golden era of Islam. Uh, of Islam. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, uh, I think the uh, the thought of, uh, of Islam uh, Islam uh, thinkers was challenging uh, sometimes in the in the past. That's the remark. I'm not sure I heard all the question. <laughs> uh, 
uh, is that not working or? Uh, I'm not sure I heard all the question. You, you, what I, I understood the main part of the question which was about the word classical. Classical, okay. Yes. I agree completely. That's an arbitrary word. I just had to glig, dig up a word from, uh, signify from, you know, uh, the time from the Caliph al muqtadir the last effective Abbasid Caliph, uh, uh, up to uh, up to the time of, uh, I, I mean, I, here I'm talking about the Mashriq, of course, from the Caliph al muqtadir the Abbasid Caliph, uh, up to the time of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, I don't know what to call it. I don't mind. The Middle Period? We want to call it the Middle Period? That's fine with me. I, I, it's not, it's, I, I, I don't defend the word classical at all. <laughs> Uh, it includes it includes many of the most heavy heavy Islamic thinkers. Uh, uh, as I said, I regard Imam al-Haramain uh, and uh, Ghazali. Uh, uh, it begins, I mean, it begins slightly before. Mawardi is the end of the Buyid period, uh, uh, and um, so we we have uh, we we have. Uh, two kinds of governments really going on in the Islamic world. Uh, sacrosanct government and uh, de facto sultanic government. I don't know what to say. And uh, um, uh, in, this, um, in this period from say 1000 to 1500, I don't know what to call it. Uh, you have a good word for it? What would you call it? Uh, Middle Islamic period? I, ju I just wonder if the word classical, the way that we use it in the West, resonates with the way we dealt with Latin and Greek studies. It's more some, maybe something like canonical Islamic thought or traditional Islamic thought. Uh, Islamic thought. So the word classical in some ways captures it or tries to make an analogy between studying Islam or studying Arabic literature at a, a period which is valorized as, as in the way that Latin and Greek culture was valorized in Western tradition. So th that's, that's my sense. But I'm wondering if the word canonical may be more our traditional. Well, many of the canonical uh, thinkers lived in that period. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. What, what word would you prefer? I am just death. saying, <laughs> it's not about the word, not about the naming of the era, but yeah. it's about that, uh, that the thinker then yes. was challenging thinkers. Yes, they the, were. They, they, were they, wasn't, they, they weren't, uh, uh, they weren't uh, uh, classical thinkers. Yes. Someone in that uh, times, uh, religious uh, times, speaking about uh, a man while king in the paradise and speaking to poets, it's a very challenging idea then, and it's funny. Uh, he, he was considered uh, as non-religious man then, and now, <laughs> even now, they, uh, yeah. they consider it, uh, him as a non-religious man, and uh, uh, even, uh, even now. That's uh, the idea that uh, there was a challenging idea in, uh, in Islamic eras, all, all of them. Right. Thank you. Well, obviously, you know, in the lives of people, they, they have different phases. I mean, I'm just thinking Abu Nuwas had Khamriyat, and uh, Abu Nuwas also had uh, uh, his poems uh, about being a tawab, about uh, being repentant. Uh, um, and so even people can have periods and moods in which they are more, more in one world than in the other. Uh, I don't think it, we can always uh, cle clearly designate a, a person or a thinker as either secular or sacred uh, inclined. Human beings are too, too clever and <laughs> too, too tricky. Je suis très heureuse de revoir le professeur Roy Motahede que j'ai rencontré deux fois en Amérique. Deux fois. <laughs> Une fois à l'issue de la Mesa 
oui. de 88. Oui, je me et rappelle. La deuxième fois sur votre invitation en 2002. Oui. Et je n'osais <rire> pas venir à cause de ce qui s'était passé en 2001. Je, 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 je vous remercie. Aussi, je, donc, me je suis rappelle, très contente oui. de vous revoir. Euh, je vais vous dire, je pense oui. que euh, j'ai beaucoup de respect pour Bernard Lewis, que j'ai rencontré plusieurs fois aussi. Oui. J'ai lu tous ses livres, que je pense les avoir tous lus, mais je ne suis pas d'accord ah oui, <rire> avec sa même. dernière réflexion ouais. qui renvoie seulement à l'époque moderne le, la sécularité. Right. C'était vraiment à la limite presque de la mauvaise foi de la part de Bernard ouais. Lewis, tant pis pour sa mémoire. Hein. Mais en réalité, ce que je crois personnellement, c'est que même au début de l'islam, il y a une ambiguïté sur le problème de la sécularité dans la mesure où la première chose qui a été faite après la mort du prophète, c'est oui. le fameux calendrier. Qu'est-ce oui. qu'il a fallu faire Supprimer un calendrier lunisolaire oui, oui. pour un calendrier lunaire, et les, tout, ce qui a amené tous les pays oui. islamisés par la suite à vivre sur deux calendriers, oui. le solaire pour la fiscalité, le lunaire pour Dieu, si je puis dire. Et donc, euh, c'est une grande, grande mauvaise foi de la part de Bernard de Huys d'oublier cela. Oui. Sans penser que, presque dès les débuts de, de l'expansion oui. de l'islam, nous avons Ibn al-Muqaffa et non. toute la littérature des Adab oui. al-Mulouk et oui. toute la littérature aussi des Anoué. Ils ont oui. dû... Les, les les musulmans étaient obligés, si je peux dire, de vivre sur deux calendriers oui. constamment. La fiscalité elle-même. Vous avez une fiscalité lunaire, Absolument. islamique entre oui. guillemets, et une, une fiscalité qu'on appelle oui. euh, euh, pudiquement mokous. Mmh. Mais les mokous ont été adoptés tout de suite par tous les souverains musulmans. C'est oui. pour ça que cette histoire de de l'absence de séparation, c'est ouais. vraiment euh, surprenant de la part de Bernard Lewis, qui connaît parfaitement oui. l'histoire du monde arabe et islamique. C'est quand même quelqu'un qui m'a dit lui-même qu'il avait quitté l'Angleterre parce qu'il avait atteint un tel degré, je cite ces phrases, ouais. hein, de seniorité qu'il est parti en Amérique ouais, ouais. parce qu'il ne pouvait plus rien faire à Londres. Donc, voilà. Personnellement, euh, je considère que c'est un faux problème. Vous avez des passages extraordinaires dans les Ibar d'Ibn Khaldun qui, qui parlent de cette séparation comme un fait établi. Oui. Quand il dit que tel homme, tel personnage oui, oui. a opté pour être mmh. donia, oui. c'est clair donc qu'il y a bien une séparation. Mmh. On n'a pas attendu l'époque moderne et les influences externes, que je ne rejette pas, hein, mmh. mais qui, qui sont caduc pour toute la période classique de l'islam. Merci. Oui, merci. Je suis tout à fait d'accord. Non, euh, euh, je suis d'origine iranienne et euh, nous, euh, entre nous, euh, le Nowruz. <rire> oui, le Nowruz. C'est... C'est le commencement de l'année. Oui, no, it, I agree completely. I, uh, I agree completely. No. Le problème du haram. Why? Mais les pronaos, les pronaos des temples antiques oui. étaient réservés aux prêtres. Oui. Le vulgus pécone ne pouvait pas rentrer dans une partie justement interdite haram. Donc les religions ont toutes en, embarqué là-dedans mm. et en réservant en quelque sorte oui, oui. Euh, aux hommes de Dieu, si je puis dire, oui, oui. Euh, une partie. Oui. Oh. D'ailleurs, il y a une ambiguïté je... entre le mot de ces haram. Oui, je suis désolé. Ok, oui, merci. Ok, ok, hi, um, thank you for the talk. Um, I just have a quick question regarding the. Sorry. Closer. Um, regarding the um, distinction between the old idea of haq and the kind of the modern idea and the and the meaning of haq in terms of the claim versus a right. Yeah, I think well, 
when you look up in a legal dictionary um, right, it says a traditional claim. So it's not, it's not, it's not, they're not remote from each other. Uh, they're, they're very close, but um, uh, I think, is a little bit more accurately translated in pre-modern contexts as claims. The uh, hakun uh, means I have a claim against you, not I have a right against you, or something like it's that. It's true, and, and the, 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 re the reason I want to point, um, the, the thing I'm trying to point, no, no, that's absolutely fine. Um, I mean, what I'm trying to point out here, I guess, is how far do you think the modern understanding of rights, which are defined as a correlative relation with duties, within the kind of institution of the state as we understand it in the, in the contemporary times, how far this distinction of right and duty and the correlative relation between them is stopping us from kind of s uh, accepting and having the parallel sacred and the secular in the same place as we used to have before, in, uh, as you say. Okay, uh, well, I think right and beauty have a lot to do with each other. I mean, uh, clearly from the Greek traditional, perhaps, I don't know, maybe, but uh, Hassan means both good and beautiful. And um, so, uh, and of course, it becomes a classification of acts uh, among Muslims. And they could have, sh there are a lot of other words they could have used, but they use the word uh, that means handsome or beautiful or whatever. Is that what you're talking about? Um it, I mean, uh, it's, uh, to be honest with you, I'm not, I'm not really into the semantics of it. I mean, I know that it actually means um, it's important, but more, more so in terms of the, the understanding of a person in terms of understanding their rights and then expecting and, and thinking, okay, this is my right and I, somebody has a duty correlating to this particular right, being God within the sacred and being the sultan or being the ruler or the state or the institutions as the kind of the line, the line develops into more. So, so, so the binary of these two and the way that you know it's very confusing. It can be extremely confusing within modern Islamic tradition. I agree. It's binary. I agree. Yeah, the uh, the individual is a nexus of hukuk. Uh, both uh, he has uh, obligations to his family, people around him, uh, etc. But he also has obligations to God. I think separating the obligations to God from uh, the obligations uh, uh, to the state resulted in a de facto, that's really what I'm saying, as a de facto uh, secular sphere. But it's not complete. It, they're, 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 it's a mixed uh, result. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm not... I'm not Speaking prescriptively, I don't know what people should do, but it seems to me I'm just talking about this, uh, this period of, of uh, thinkers that I know best. Uh, from. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the comparison of trying to think about the secular, um, comparing the modern era with the classical Islamic yeah. uh, era in which your, your work is situated. Mm -hmm. um, one question related to that is is in the modern era secular secularism or the secular mm. um, has a very has moral assumptions and civil civilizationist assumptions right. attached to them this person is secular then this person fits in the modern world right. um, this group is secular it's it's um, um, it then um, deserves to be represented under a modern right, democracy right, and right, so right. on and so forth and the ways that you've um, Described the way sec the secular is in in the period when your uh, your work is situated is that it's um, described it as actions mm. secular actions but right. also space that is physical but also maybe conceptual mm. um, in the modern era it's very much also associated with individuals being secular versus individuals who are not secular religious oh. and so on so I was wondering in the era in uh, in this classical Islamic um, mm -hmm. era or in Islamic classical Islamic mm -hmm. thought. To what extent is secular also comes up in relation to individuals or not, and whether there are any moral or civilization, in the way moral assumptions that are attached to um, the secular, being secular or being um, secular actions, practices, and, and yeah. so on? Well, in Michael Cook's brilliant book on, uh, on the, uh, the Hispa, Hispa duty, 
Hispa duty is, I've taught several seminars on Hispa, I love it. <laughs> it's a fascinating subject, the Mohtazib. Uh, anyway, but in the book, Michael Cook's brilliant book on Hispa duty, he talks about the fact that all kinds of uh, reactions were permitted to the believer when faced with uh, physical force. And uh, some Muslim thinkers, and so they say, you know, you can inside of yourself say, I don't b uh, believe, or <laughs> I don't agree, or something. But you don't have to necessarily say it out, out loud. It, it's, there's a, of course, there's a struggle in Islamic thought, as there is everywhere, uh, to what extent you externalize your disagreement. Uh, I'm a great believer in, uh, regardless of any system and freedom of expression, I must admit, but, I, uh, but uh, it, um, freedom of uh, expression, it was recognized that you did not always have complete freedom of expression and that uh, you, there were occasions on which it was wiser to be silent. And so uh, um, that was very helpful to rulers, uh, absolute rulers or, or dictatorial rulers. Um, so uh, that doesn't completely answer your question, but in, in part, yeah. I think it's gonna please, be please, go on, go on. I think um, maybe one disti distinction between the uh, batin and the zahir, I think, is the batin what is inside versus Na'am. what is oh, okay. performed or. Um, right, right, right. Yes, no, I wrote um, the book that Bill referred to, Mantle of the Prophet. I talk a lot about how people talk about you can have a pure botan uh, uh, while having a, um, a compromising zahir. Yeah, uh, and how this is be became a cultural value. Uh, I, uh, yes. <laughs> I, I think it's absolutely true. In some situations, this was settled by, by distinction between Batan and Zahir, yeah. But um, not all rulers, all thinkers felt this. The Islamic world was multivocal. Uh, was part of what makes it so interesting, it was multivocal, it was not univocal. And people did have different expressions. Thank you very much, and uh, join me in thanking you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. We'll be here for another half an hour, so feel free to have something to drink, or if you'd like to come up and say hello to Professor Canada, you're welcome to do that. But uh, again, thank you for coming. <coughs> thank you.